Okay, we're live. Good morning, everybody. It is <coughs> the 24th of March, Friday. So we have an interesting chat today, I think. We're going to discuss a little bit um, of a subject which we should all consider. This, meanwhile, the slaughterhouse of failure is not in our destiny. We shall persevere until we succeed. Oh, Mandy, no modified. Today, we're going to be defining courage. Discuss a little bit on risk and courage. The motivation of our decisions of risk-taking or not. Why do some people take risks and others don't? Why are some people really cautious and others are not? Are we? Where are we? Um, Dan fished out a, a study which is about this subject using different, uh, different objectives, but we've adapted it or we're adapting it to our business. Daniel Kahneman, um, economist, talked about loss aversion. Loss aversion can be a cause of mediocre thinking and dwelling on the comfort zone of known factors. That's what we're, we're saying that right now. That's what I'm writing. I'm saying myself that. What is loss aversion? Loss aversion is remaining in the comfort zone of wherever we are, of known situations, known factors. Our situations right now are really volatile. Job, political, societal, security, all of these things are unstable. So forced courage is necessary to make some dramatic changes. Prior to COVID, it took courage for someone to say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to do this, this is what I'm going to do and go off and go and do it in the blue yonder. Well, post courage, post COVID, the whole thing, situation has changed. Our job stability, our social stability, our political stability, everything has become unstable. So now we've got to find the courage to make certain dramatic decisions. So is it courage? What is courage? What prompts it? These are things we're going to chat a little bit about. Yeah, and so they, they um, Daniel Kahneman uh, and his group, they define loss aversion as the idea that losses loom larger than gains. And they documented this in years of psychological and economic research um, that courage, or, or more importantly, loss aversion is thought to be an important component in human decision making. You know, if we're so loss averse, why do we take such big swings in our lives? Or, or why do certain people take more risk? And that's kind of what they set out to, to look at. And, and is courage really the reason that people take more, some people take more risks than others? Or is it something else? So their theory is that courage is what really drives more people to, or some people to, to get outside their comfort zone and take these risks. risks. Um, the ability to take purposeful action in the face of fear um, is widely prized across cultures. Um, one study found that courage was among just six values shared by nearly every philosophical and religious tradition. So when people see an opportunity to be courageous and want to see themselves as courageous, that may actually lead to a preference for the riskier option. Um, it's that wanting to be courageous or wanting others to look at you as courageous. But because of much of the research on risk and loss aversion focuses on low stakes financial gambles, for instance, you know, if you flip a coin, heads, you lose $10. What amount do you need to win from a tail flip in order to take that gamble? And obviously, as the amounts get higher, that for most people, that risk aversion or loss aversion um, kicks in. Um, but, but what they really wanted to look at, Rucker and Gal, who are two other gentlemen in this space, suspected different patterns might emerge if they studied important life decisions where courage is most likely to emerge. So and when, when we face a risky choice with meaningful consequences in our lives, do we have the opportunity to display courage? And because people prize being courageous, in contrast to prior research that was done, do they 
they may be more likely to opt for the high risk, high reward path. So why do some people, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Why do some people take that path and others do not? When people see an opportunity to be courageous and want to see themselves as courageous, that may actually lead to a preference for that riskier option, like I said. Lawrence? Yeah, it's like, for example, the difference between a W-2 and a 1099. If we look at that, we say, well, <clears throat> risk aversion is W-2, going to have a secure job. Well, there's no such thing anymore, really. But that's theoretically one of the things we're looking at is to say, well, what would prompt someone to, do a 10, to get into a 1099 as opposed to a W-2? Whereas the W-2, he has at the end of the month or the end of the 15 days or whatever, he's got something coming in that he can be relatively sure of. Whereas in a 1099, he may have nothing coming in for a month or two months. And then the possibility of having a lot more than the person on W-2 makes it a riskier decision. But it also makes it a much more worthwhile decision if that um, courage, that uh, courageous decision is taken to do that. So ego can fuel, can be a fuel for both. You can have, for example, whether you're bold or you're reckless, what is the difference? Being reckless is one thing, being bold is another. Ego has both, has factors that affect both. So courageous has a lot of other things that are influencing that action. So a soldier is forced to act in times of conflict. He can either be a leader or a follower. When he's in the trenches, he's either a, a follower or he emerges as a leader. What inspires him to be courageous? What inspires him to, to lead? What inspires him to take the, the to, to, to be courageous and do things? So the decent, deep, deeper reasoning for spontaneous action of a, of a soldier. So there are many things that, that can affect that. For example, it's the upbringing that the person has. Some people are brought, you know, the, 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 the um, upbringing, the um, environment in which we ha we're brought up in, how many siblings we've got, how difficult our lives were or how easy they were, um, what the situation of the, uh, of the, the economic situation was. All of these different things affect a person's thinking, whether he's, whether he's going to be um, courageous or risk avert risk or have risk aversion so um, these are these are things we've got to think about when we're considering the people that we work with you know working from home as an entrepreneur prior to covid was something that was it needed to be courageous to say i'm 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 not prior to covid I don't want to have a job. I want to be my own boss. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my own, just be my own boss. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. That was actually a courageous thing to do prior to COVID. COVID came along and suddenly everybody has had to rethink how they live and what they do and, 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 and how they're living. So now it's become more appetizing to be able to, to work from home and to be independent, to take that, 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 that plunge or that jump into being independent. That is a courageous thing to do, but it's a forced courageous thing to do now, rather than, thanks to COVID, rather than a choice of courage prior to COVID. Yeah, and one of the things that they really looked at was, the courage to take risks. And what they found was that the desire to be courageous did not significantly influence people's willingness to take risks when facing a trivial choice, only a significant one. So when it was more likely to affect their long-term, yeah, long-term life, then they were much more likely to be courageous. Um, but then they looked at is courageous, is courage just an appetite for risk? or the opposite risk uh, loss aversion, and what they found was that not, ex not exactly. So the results showed of, of a, an additional study that they did 
that courageous people, uh, courage increases people's risk appetite more strongly when the decision has long-term significance for their lives. So they're, they're willing to take more risk if it has, you know, if they per perceive it as having positive long-term significance for their lives. So for me, when I was looking into this, this whole concept of loss aversion and, and learning about how courage plays a role in that, um, I started thinking about what we're doing to recruit physicians, what we're doing to recruit um, medical device reps or anybody that's interested in the business. And, you know, we look at all these different things. We look at the resume, we look at, you know, their, their entrepreneurship and all of these different things, but are we looking at how courageous they may, may be or how, um, what, what their attitude towards loss aversion is? Um, so I think that's just one more feather in our cap that we can utilize when we're talking to people to see if this is the right business opportunity for them. And that just, that, you know, what the end result of that may be is, you know, how willing are they to step out their comfort zone, um, not take a corporate job, be paid for what they do, um, the work that they do, the scanners that they place, the, whether they integrate them properly into practices. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a question that I start asking people when I talk to them about the business is how courageous are they? And if they see themselves as a courageous person, if they see themselves as an entrepreneur, they see themselves as a self-starter, those are the people that I want to look for. So this is just, you know, and then from, from our position as folks who are already in the business and, and working the business is how courageous are we? How, what's our appetite for, for risk aversion or loss aversion? You know, and we can actually change that by thinking differently about risk or thinking differently about how courageous we are. So we, not only do we need to, you know, utilize this as a tool to, to recruit, but we also need to utilize this as a tool to help ourselves grow. So this, this whole theme about risk and courage and so on, again, when we, when we ask the question, who are you? And how well do you know yourself? Um, very often when we interviewing people to work with us in our, in, our, uh, in our work, the things we listen for are, for example, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm a dreamer and I'm an em empathetic, em I have a lot of empathy and I love and all. That's nice. But, but are you determined? Are you a risk taker? We don't, we don't, I don't say that. I just wait for them to say that if somebody says that. Because if somebody is a risk taker, you can actually find that out by asking questions of who they are. And, and those are more attractive to us with, because they're more, they believe more in themselves, in ourselves. If you believe in yourself unquestionably, then you would probably be more successful by also being. Um, disciplined, of course, but I'm, I'm just saying that believing in themselves, in ourselves, makes us more bold in, in how we approach life, more secure, more self-assured, more have better self-esteem, have all of these things that are traits that we look for in individuals and actually help to bring them out by helping somebody believe in him or herself, by making them, by making us feel that we are doing something worthwhile and we, we grow with all of this. And this is the excitement in my opinion about this business is being able to help everybody find their, their maximum level of, of um, possibilities through their work ethic. And, and the people that have good self-esteem and that have courage are probably more likely to be more successful than the risk aversion people that just want to be told, do this, do this, and do the minimum and kind of float along. Yeah, you know, one of, one of the things for me with this business is, um, you know, it's a different mindset shift for me away from helping myself to helping others. And so I had to have the courage to, to take that mindset of helping others. And one of the 
unexpected consequences of helping others, not, not consequences, one of the under, uh, benefits <laughs> that su surprisingly, and I've heard this a lot, when you do things for the right reason and you help other people, good things are going to happen to you. And I've had that happen tremendously throughout my time in the last five years in this business. And I've learned a lot and I've grown and I've learned to be even more courageous in helping others. And that's, a, that's really what this business is about. I mean, it's about helping people. It's about helping them financially through the business. It's about helping them um, nutritionally through making, you know, educating them on how they're getting proper nutrition and what the benefits of that are. So we're really educators um, and we're really leaders and we have to have the courage to do both of those things, right? Because it may not be in our wheelhouse. You know, I didn't know a lot about nutrition. I didn't know a lot about preventive medicine before I got involved in this business. And sometimes, you know, a lot of us will sit around and we'll think about the what ifs and what's happening in the, what could happen in the future. What are the consequences of talking to somebody about this business? What are the consequences of talking to somebody that you respect about this business and nutrition? And we just have to have the courage to just have that conversation and the courage to educate them on what we know and what we have, both from a nutritional standpoint, but also from a business perspective. And, you know, sometimes that takes courage. You know, we, some people just get stagnant and they, they just sit there and think about being active and, and doing what they need to do to be successful doing something. And they get caught up in the thinking about it. They get caught up in the, you know, what ifs? Um, what if I talk to this doctor and he says no? You know, and psychologically, you know, a lot of people that that keep, that keeps them from having those conversations because they're worried that somebody's going to say no, and that's a blow to their ego, or that's a blow to you know their business acumen. If somebody's questioning the business side of it, so we need to be more courageous. We need to have that courage. We need to be um, not so concerned about that loss aversion or what our what our um, aversion is to. To, to the potential downfalls of having those conversations or introducing this or educating. You know, it, it does take courage. You know, this may be out of your wheelhouse. And anytime you do something outside your wheelhouse, outside your comfort zone, it takes courage. You know, one of the things that, that uh, I often talk about with people is say, I don't want anybody to get to my age saying, I wish I could have, should have, would have. Because at my age, you know, I'm 77 now, well, 76, but going on 77. And people at my age still say, oh, I wish I could have done this. I should have done that. I could have done that. Well, there are no excuses. I started in this business when I was 60. And, you know, a lot of people said, you're crazy, man. Why? I have my reasons for it. But... The point is that it takes, it takes courage to make, to do something. And then you may have regrets, but the, the upside can be far greater than the downside. And you don't know until you've done it. So unless you've, you've taken a risk to do something, unless you've had the courage to do something, you'll never know. And then you get to the end of the, line into the runway with remorse and say wonder what it would have been like i wish i could have done that well you know by that time it's too late so the the the, the courage is in anything we do everything we do if we if we think about it in a very positive way we can derive a lot of personal satisfaction from that and how we how we how we live our lives what we do with our lives yeah, exactly. And sometimes we spend more time thinking about the consequences of doing something more so than the consequences of not doing it. Right. Um, and there's because of that, there can be a lot of missed opportunities. You know, I have someone that's on my team that sat back for the last three years, hasn't really done a whole lot. He had one conversation with a couple of buddies and they're all kind of working the business. And, you know, he decided that, um, he wanted to bring his son into the business. And so they brought, he brought his son into the business. He's now joined him in the business. And now they're having conversations. They're not just sitting there thinking about the what ifs 
and studying all the material, but not talking about it, not educating people. Well, guess what? Now he's out talking to people and he's seeing tremendous success. And I said exactly what we're talking about here to him. I said, well, don't you wish you would have done this three years ago? Because now you've sat on this for three years and you could have been three years further ahead than you were when you got started. But for whatever reason, you had this loss aversion and you didn't do anything. You just sat in your office and, and talked about it and educated yourself on it. He's He knows more about this business than anybody I've, I know in this business, but way more than I know. But now he's utilizing that information. And now he's he's having those conversations. He's educating physicians. He's educating other reps who want to get out of medical device sales on how they can do it. And as he continues to do that, sure, he's going to have some failures, if you want to call them that. But he's also going to have some wins because he's out there talking about it. If you're not out there working the business, you're not going to get wins or losses. So there's the motivation. See, these are the exogenous things that I'm talking about. So this is a guy who's who knows all the theories, paralysis by analysis. He knows everything. And maybe financially or maybe maybe financially didn't need to do something until his son is now in it. Now he's got a motivation to, to do something. He's got something that's going to drive him. So he will give courage to his son. And he will give, he will motivate his son. So this is where, this is where we have, we have all these mindset or mind factors or, or, or conscious or unconscious mind thoughts that actually play into our actions. And, and what motivates us? What, what slows us down? What are the cobwebs, cobwebs we've got? Why do we have these cobwebs in our mind that slow us down? What makes us risk averse? And if we can think about these things and we can think about the motivation, then courage is something that becomes almost natural because we've, we, we, we just take the bull and go for it. But a lot of these things, as I've said before, as I've just said, have a lot have to do with our society, our upbringing, our families, our, a lot of things that go with it. So... So I think, I think we have and we are in a position to help a lot of people find themselves. And as you said, Dan, also, you know, you, you were for 28 years or nine years, you know, in an operating room. And you kind of didn't go out of that 24-7 on call. And suddenly, four years ago, you came out of that. And wow, there's a whole another world out there. What's happened in this other four years? You became courageous. You, you, you got married. That's a big courageous thing to do. You got married. You've, you've, you've got a family. Now, I mean, you know, kids that, that you've got as well. And, and you've completely changed your life. Completely changed your life. That's, that's actually a courageous thing to do, to come out of where you were in a comfort zone, which was successful because you're extremely hardworking person but that's what we're looking for we're looking for 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 those people that we can help find themselves yeah i mean five years ago for 20 20 years i was in my little 15 mile 15 square mile bubble um i didn't have the relationships that i have today with people on this call i didn't have relationships with people all over the country I didn't have relationship, business relationships with people all over the world. So, you know, I'm, I'm outside my comfort zone. I've met lots of tremendous people, work with great physicians um, that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with um, to help them grow, you know, their practice, to help them grow financially, to help them grow um, as business people, as entrepreneurs. And that's really what we're here for. You know, we're here to help others and if you have that mentality and you go out there and you, you work every day and you educate people and you do what you need to do to be successful, we're going to help people. And ultimately, that's what we're here for. So go ahead. Somebody's got something to say. Yeah, I, I recommend everyone listen to this strangest secret. And it's almost right up the line. If you ever heard that by Earl Nightingale, 
and he talks just about what you're talking about. But what he says is the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. People doing what everyone else is doing, and they don't even know why. And they say, if you surveyed 100 people, when you go out and ask them, why do you go to work today? They don't even know why they're going to work. Well, everybody goes to work. They don't even know. They just they just conformed to their environment and society. So it's not even that, that, that courage, it's they, they conformity, I think, is what's what people do. So it's, it's an amazing CD. It's an old 1920 CD by Earl Nightingale, but he gets into that. Like We're all like in a convoy of ships. You could be in a speedboat. But you're forced to go the speed of the con the slowest ship in the convoy, even though you could blow past everyone. And so just that um uh, amazing thing. So, you know, just looking at what people aren't, it's not that they're not courageous, they've just conformed and then they don't even know why. That's that's a great point. I was just sitting out having a chai latte on my front porch today, and I was sitting out there thinking, I'm like, you know what? People say I'm crazy a lot. And I'm like <laughs> you <laughs> am i am i crazy or are they, they they the crazy ones this is the internal conversation i was having with myself i'm not crazy i just don't do what everybody else does therefore most people say that that's crazy or you're crazy but i think the crazy people are the people that are conforming to to what society says you should do go to college get married get a job work for somebody <laughs> else not work for yourself not to do what's best for you and your family the sheep right they're the sheep and i think those people are crazy you got you guys have got some really good points this morning and vince vince hit the nail on the head too you know we're indoctrinated to do this we we're we're brought up in a capitalistic country and we're taught never to take our training wheels off you know that it's dangerous work for another capitalist but don't be a capitalist and you know it's that fear of stepping outside of what we don't know that keeps us from doing that. And, you know, we're, we're brought up, um, you don't wanna take risk is what we're taught. We're taught that, why would you take that risk? But if you really understand it, the risk, you know, what you're doing now is probably more risky than, than it would be if, if you did it yourself, if you started your own business and pursued your own dreams. And as Vince said, if, you know, if you're in a speedboat, but you're in a flotilla, you're only going as fast as the slowest ship. So educate yourself. We were brought up and indoctrinated into one method. As you said, get a job. This is not the only method out there. Check it out, educate yourself, and then you're going to realize there's not that much of a risk after all. It's more risky, perhaps, doing what you're doing, as Dan mentioned, being a sheep. Long term, right? Long term, that's definitely more risky because you're getting paid a salary. You have a cap on how much you're going to make. At some point, you're going to hit that ceiling and you're not going to make any more money, right? So what do, you know, what do people do when they hit that point? They say, oh, I'm going to look for another job where maybe I can make more money or I can move up higher. Or they, they settle. They just continually do that. Yeah, or they settle, which is even worse. Don't be yeah. crazy. But there's actually a reason for, for our thinking. And that is, historically, people, large corporate people used to work for a corporation for example and you know granddad worked in that company mitsubishi for example and dad worked in mitsubishi and then i'm going to work in mitsubishi and my kids are going to work in mitsubishi well the world has changed and evolved where people those companies no longer do that the the system has completely changed people the companies have merged and changed themselves and so that um, that security that people used to think they had no longer exists. And that's what creates creative thinking to say, well, you know, I, there's no future in that because I can't be sure that anything's going to happen. The only thing I can be sure of is me. That's the only person I can rely on is me, nobody else. Because I'm the one who's in control of my own life. And that's where we, we start to get entrepreneurial thinking. We start to get creative thinking. We start to take courageous steps because we are in control of our lives. And we realize that when everybody else, when, when nothing else is working in the same way as it used to work, things have changed. All things have changed, everything. And in fact, COVID has been an incredibly great lesson for everybody to rethink their lives. Nothing's ever going to go back to what it was pre-COVID, nothing. And then the entire planet. So it's exciting times. 
Well, there's cycles that go through in society. So if you look at prior to the 1900s, 80 plus percent of America were self-employed and entrepreneurs. You worked on the farm, you did. Everybody worked for themselves. And then when the uh, the, um, the the steel magnets, Carnegie got together, he had this vision for the whole country, and he actually created the education system. We're going to create an education system, and they convinced people, hey, it's not good to work for yourself. You want to work for these companies we're going to create. And then they 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 rang the bell so you showed to school. They rang the bell so you got lunch. Then they rang the bell to let you go home. And they basically conditioned people through this education system, said, hey, this is not how it's going to be. And they conditioned people through this ringing of the bell. Then you left the the ringing of the bell to the blowing of the whistle. Boop, whistle blows, you got to show up to work. Boop, whistle blows, you get to go to lunch. Boop, whistle blows the end of the day. So this was actually, if you look at who set it up, it was Carnegie, uh, Rockefeller, uh, Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan. And they said, hey, we're going to change the system when, when we became industrialized. And that's where they came up with the concept of, hey, you don't want to work by yourself. That's dangerous. You want to work, you want to be a part of a company. And that was literally a societal change. And that's what COVID did. We actually have another, it's the book, Who Moved My Cheese? It's literally happening now. We're seeing it happen. And so, and, you know, so that, that whole, that whole sequence was changed. And that was actually set up by them. Um, so it's just interesting. So if you actually go back and study where all this stuff, how it actually started, I mean, who actually came up with a salary? If someone says, oh, I want a salary, like, well, who do you think invented that? The capitalist or the employee? You think an employee went to his boss, hey, I got an idea. Give me one dollar amount and you can work me to death as many hours as you want. It doesn't matter. And so, again, the rationalization of if you look at where this stuff comes from to how it's passed on down. But again, it goes back to that conformity concept. Good. Thank you. I'm someone who didn't go to school. I didn't, you know, my mentor taught me, look what everyone else is doing and make sure you're doing the opposite. Good. Well, thank you. Nuggets. Anybody else got anything to add? Anybody else want to say anything? <clears throat> Comment? Anybody? I'll say uh, that, that there's a lot of leaders. If you look, if you look at very successful people, they believe that it's a moral obligation to be in you're breaking up michael that's true michael <clears throat> so you know if you have a bill you're not maximizing your potential then then it's um it's it's morally uh corrupt that it's it's a moral obligation to do the best not just for you but for everyone involved and dan talked about this earlier uh if you're helping other people it's going to come back to you and, and Ten, tenfold so that think about that if you're not if you're not being you know doing your very best it's uh it's it's morally wrong yep good um, so uh i thought it was very interesting when you brought up the topic of conformity and um i think that when you look at our business there is such little risk to our business. You know, we're not making a hundred thousand or half million dollar investment. We're not hiring people. We're not signing leases. So the risk, that kind of risk, financial risk is minimal to nothing. But I think one of the biggest risks, certainly I and others may see is that this perceived risk of losing face by trying something everyone else is afraid to try because they don't want to be embarrassed by those who all conform. And we need to just make that a non-risk. This is not a risk at all. It's a negative perception only. And it can be a very limiting factor. And it's actually driven by our ego that could be limiting us. So we need to drop the ego and get out and go to work and not worry about what everyone else thinks. 100%. That's what we're talking about. That's it belief in yourself and 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 self-esteem and the ego which is, drives us and if we've if we've got sufficient self-belief who cares what other people think they're not putting bread on our table Sorry. nothing takes more courage than to go against those people in your life that may think that you're doing the wrong making the wrong decision there's a story i read and it really set me free and it was about uh funerals and it said at the average funeral, five people are going to cry. The average funeral, five people cried. And then it went on to say that on the way from the uh, funeral hall to the burial, if it's raining, half of the people 
will dip out because of the rain. And that blew my mean I'm, in my mind. I was like, you ain't, wait a minute. I'm going to go through my whole life, help everybody try to be this good person. And only five people are actually going to be sad that they put me in the ground. And the other half of the people are going to dip out because of the weather. So I mean, you mean the weather, the weather has more to do with who's going to show up to my funeral than how I live my life. And we spend our lives worrying about these people. And I'm like, first of all, you ain't going to cry at my funeral. And you're probably going to be one of the people that dips out because of the weather. And so why do I care what you think? And it's so weird how we we have this perception that we care what these people think. And then, you know, once you realize like, well, wait, and they're not going to probably cry at my funeral and they're probably going to dip out because of the weather. And so and it just amazes me how we worry about this. And I don't know, that just really kind of messed me up. I mean, man, no one's even going to care that I'm gone and the other half ain't even going to show up. <laughs> well, so basically, the moral of this is have the funeral on a sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great i'll put that no i'm gonna put that in my way <laughs> don't, don't die in the rainy season <laughs> okay. all, right. all right anybody else well if not thank you everybody for being on the call hope you got something out of it look forward to seeing you next monday on on uh, scott bennett's call and wednesday on mancy um and kent uh and Kent's call on Wednesday morning at 9 30. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Wasn't wasn't the lion on Wizard of Oz and we go out and have courage? Yes. There we go. Let's all be lions today. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Go. Love it. Hey guys, blessed weekend everyone. Have Very a good call. Thanks guys. Thanks good guys. Day. Have a great weekend. Thanks guys. Great call. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.